Welcome back to another episode of The Beginner's Guide to the 18th Century. My name is Kendall, and I am so honored today to be joined by Sarah Woodyard. Sarah, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am excited about all the things that we are going to chat about. Before we get started, you can find Sarah on sewncompany.com, but she has a very long history in living history. So why don't you give us a little information about how you got started. I won't, I won't give away any details. I'll let you do that. Well, essentially, I've always been really interested in history and clothes. Um, my, I like to joke that I had like the best dress up box on the block when I was little. <laughs> um, so I was able to um, kind of play with old clothes even when I was little. And going into college, I knew that I really wanted to study historic dress with fashion design. Um, and I also knew that I wanted the ability to do hands-on research, understand the people of the past, but through the clothing that they wore. Um, and so I found that there was this amazing opportunity at the Margaret Hunter Millinery Shop at Colin Williamsburg. Um, and the whole historic trades department actually has an apprenticeship program uh, in, each, in each shop. Uh, and so I was fortunate enough to actually get hired on as an apprentice in 2008 at the Margaret Hunter Millinery Shop, where I served a seven year apprenticeship. And I completed my apprenticeship, became a journeywoman, and it was a phenomenal training experience. It truly was an apprenticeship uh, to be able to study the uh, skill and the making of the past, to then, of course, educate a visiting public on a daily basis, because, of course, the millinery shop is one of the places you can go visit at Colin Williamsburg. Uh, and so I was in costume all day. So not only did I get to learn about, say, how clothing was made, preserving those skills, but also what it was like to wear the clothing um, and to really understand the clothing, not so much as a costume, but more as the clothing itself, which was really invaluable. Um, and then in 2018, I decided it was time to move on. Uh, and so then I started my own company, Sewn Company, which is what I run today, where I am still continuing to do hands-on research based on uh, extant garments. I take on commissions. And then of course, education is a huge uh, part of that as well, because I think we can't preserve a trade, we can't preserve a skill without people learning it. Right. Uh, so, that, it's, so essentially there's a, a research, a design, and then an education part of Sewn Company. That is a thrilling career that you have had, especially for people who are, you know, coming into this community and, and trying to figure out all these things. Maybe they visit, visited Colonial Williamsburg or another living yeah. history site. And they've, you know, I think sometimes when you're on the outside looking in, um, it's like going to Disney World and trying to figure <laughs> out like, you know, how does Snow White do what Snow White does, right? It's, sure. it's, uh, yeah. it's pretty exciting. And um, I think, or you go to a reenactment and you see these reenactors and you're like, well, like, how do you do that? So what is it like when you, you know, you mentioned like wearing the clothes, working in a shop like that, what is that experience like? Yeah, um, specifically as it relates to, say, wearing the clothing, um, the, I would like to start with, say, the stays, because I think that for some people who are getting into living history, um, those can be a bit of a hurdle, either because they're hard to find, they're hard to fit, they're hard to make, because stay making was a trade in the 18th century, so it does require <laughs> some skill. Um, but also I know that there is some some kind of, um, there's a little bit of a transition from being, say, uh, a person who doesn't wear such a structured bodice to wearing a structured bodice, especially if you're, you know, going out a couple, say, weekends a month. Uh, maybe it's not what you're used to wearing. Um, but from personal experience, the stays provided so much support for my body. Um, and honestly, it's probably one of the things I miss wearing the most because it provided so much back support, great chest support. Uh, it reminded me of the way to, to, to stand. Um, also, uh, if you are doing a lot of physical labor, say you uh, are interpreting, say, someone who does laundry, say a woman who is following the army, having that, that structure is really going to aid in your work versus, say, hinder it. In a lot of cases um, and so I found it was amazing kind of what I learned about that garment just through wearing it on a daily basis. So did you going into this position at Williamsburg were you already doing all of this historical sewing? I, I was doing some um, okay. so kind of I guess like a um, I should say like I didn't go into it as a reenactor. I know that a lot of people are living historians um, and they see a job like that as kind of like the ideal perfect opportunity for them. Um, but I went into it as a, I guess I could say like a, 
uh, a dress making historian or like a, a dress historian. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to do an internship actually with the millinery shop when I was in college mm -hmm. to kind of just get a sense of that that, that type of work was interesting to me. Uh, and so my historical sewing really started relating to the 18th century, honestly, about the time that I did that internship. Uh, I had been interested in the 18th century, but I hadn't really fallen in love with it, I think, uh, especially, especially with the hand sewing until I did the did that internship. But after that, uh, I really fell in love with it. And, and after that summer, made a bunch of clothing for myself, uh, continued on that track until I was fortunate enough to get hired uh, and work there full time. Um, so, I mean, and something else I think it's important to note, it's like, there's definitely a difference between being a visitor and being a person that works there. Um, I think that people in the reenacting, the living history community, um, some of the folks understand that, um, you know, it is a very much a professional job and mm -hmm. educating on a daily basis to a, a visiting public uh, requires a lot of background knowledge, a lot of skill. Um, and it is something that um, requires a lot of, your own research, your own attention to detail, and then of course being open to learn from others and also really looking at the actual objects of the past. And so if you are someone who is, is doing this as a hobby and you ever go to a historic site, you know, I would just re recommend that you please uh, remember that it is someone's job and it is their profession, it is their career. Um, and so that you go there with kind of an understanding of, of kind of respect for, for that. Yeah. Um, and also when you visit a historic site, you know, like really thank the interpreter for their time because, um, you know, like anything, it's, it's really oftentimes something that people have poured so much of their, their self into. What is the first thing that you ever made that you were just like, this is it. I'm so proud of this work. This, this means so much to me. That's a, that's a good question. Cause there's like so many different things. Honestly, on, often it's the thing I've completed most recently okay. um, because I have kind of a bad habit of wanting to learn something new every time I make something. And so I have, uh, I don't often say make the same thing over and over again. I like to, you know, dig into the research and, and make something new. Um, but I will say that kind of the a big culminating project that I was um, probably the most proud of was, um, so of course in the apprenticeship, um, and I feel like I need to note that, of course, I, I do not speak for Colonial Williamsburg. Of course, yeah. I'm not affiliated with Colonial Williamsburg anymore. But one of the most exciting projects that I ever worked on um, was a large recreation project for my final apprenticeship. So when you're an apprentice, each year you actually have a different skill set that you uh, you undertake. So there's year one, there's year two, et cetera. And then there's a cul culminating final project. And so there's actually three final projects that you have to do. You have to recreate from an extant garment, you have to make something to fit a body, and you also have to make something from a picture and interpret what's being worn in the image. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I picked um, one of the few surviving images that we have of English milliners, uh, an image called a morning ramble or the milliner shop. And I was for a woman on that project to recreate all three articles of clothing that the women were wearing in that, that picture. Um, and so I was responsible for either overseeing the patterning or actually creating the design, such as like the bums and the aprons and um, a lot of the garments that were being worn in that in that particular image. Um, and then I led a really awesome work day of a bunch of people coming together and sewing pieces together. And then I gave a lecture uh, during a conference, kind of talking about the meanings of the image, talking about the meanings of kind of like gender identity, sexuality, as it interconnects with the millinery business at the time. Um, and we recreated the, the whole portrait on stage. Wow. So for me, that, that's, was prob that's probably been the most exciting project because I love the designing element of it. I like stepping back and breaking all the pieces down um, and kind of visualizing what that image might have been in, in reality. Um, you know what, I realized we should probably back up a little bit because we do have people who are watching the show now and they are very, very, very new to 18th century living history. And they're probably right. hearing this term millinery a lot, which we hear it a lot. And they might be thinking, well, yeah. what is that? What does that mean? Because sometimes that's associated right. with hats and what does millinery mean? So maybe break that down a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's such a good point. Um, so let me actually define both millinery and mantua making because mantua making is kind of like a bizarre word too, right, I think. Right. Yeah, um, but yeah, millinery. Yeah, that's a really good point. So millinery, of course, today means a hat maker, a hat creator. 
in the 18th century, milliners were actually creating all of the extra pieces that went with a woman's wardrobe, a man's wardrobe, or a child's wardrobe, what we would call accessories today. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's important to note that milliners um, were not making accessories in the 18th century because the word accessory meant someone who helped with a crime. So, you know, it's like, sure, your wardrobe could be a crime, but like, you know, an accessory is not like the cap or the apron or the head wrap that you're wearing, you know? Um, and so instead the millinery uh, meant like the apron, the ruffle, the neck stock, and, and so forth. Um, also, those those were often called ornaments. They, uh, they were called sometimes if they were kind of de overly done, like fippery is another word you might see kind of thrown out, out mm -hmm. there. And then as it relates to mantua making, that is the person who made the upper body fitted garments, typically for women, though some mantua makers did make other things too. Um, so sometimes there was a little bit of, you know, uh, um, crossover, um, but that's typically your mantua maker is cutting and fitting, say, jackets and gowns to fit the body. And I should note that a mantua maker, that trade was not considered like fancy. It wasn't like going to a couture house today. Uh, your typical everyday person um, from really all walks of life, either be it you know, someone really wealthy or, or someone on the lower sort uh, or someone who is enslaved, they're going to be getting clothing that is potentially custom made for them. Uh, labor was inexpensive. It's really the textiles that's the expense. Um, and so if you are, say, portraying somebody um, who is doing a lot of physical work on a daily basis and you're wearing a fitted garment, it likely would have been either cut by a mantua maker in the 18th century or cut and sewn by a mantua maker in the 18th century. What about the undergarments, like the shifts and the stays? Who would have made those? Sure. So a shift was made by a variety of people. Um, in Virginia, an enslaved woman who was a seamstress might have made a shift. You might have bought them ready-made at a millinery shop or at, say, a general storehouse um, because they were being made by people who are not paid a lot over in England right. and then imported pre-made. You also do see women who have a little bit of more time, luxury of time, um, making shifts in the home. So you actually see them made in a whole host of places because they are such a vital part of at least the English woman's wardrobe. And they don't have to be so fitted. They're not exactly cut to the body. Right, yeah. They, so typically linen was actually woven at a certain width that was intended to be made into either a shirt or a shift. Mm -hmm. And then that large rectangle would then be cut into other geometric shapes, such as other rectangles or triangles in order to create a voluminous garment that would be worn underneath a pair of stays. Um, and it's also important to note that you also see women who are from native populations, for example, like the Pamunkey women in Virginia, the Nottoway women in Virginia, uh, might have been wearing a shift after contact with the English mm -hmm. as an outer garment. So the way that a native woman might view a shift is very different than, say, the way that someone is uh, being dress dressing in an English style uh, might use a shift. And then stays would, who, who, because stays are such an important fitted right component. yeah so um, I probably should do some sort of video about my experience just wearing stays because I just I really liked them and I thought they were wonderful um, but you do of course have stay makers who were trained specifically in the making of them just because the measuring is so specific to the body um, but then you also see examples of like secondhand stays being sold uh, you see examples of uh, people talking about stays being sold in their shop and almost indicating that they're not ready-made, but they might have been like partially made up and then fitted to a particular person. Um, so again, kind of that notion that they are accessible to a broad scope of people if they are dressing in that manner. Right, right. You know, something about the stays is that, um, again, if you are, say, a, re a living historian or a reenactor who maybe wears them maybe 10 times in a year, 12 times right. in a year, um, that may not be an, it might be enough time, but sometimes it's not enough time to actually even wear them in. So right. like my stays that I wore for maybe seven years or so, um, I had a couple pairs that I would wear, um, were actually boned with split oak, which is what you get from basket makers. And you can still get split oak from basket makers to, to bone your stays with. Um, it does feel very rigid. So for about the first week of wearing them for eight hours a day, so for about 40 hours of wearing, they did feel very rigid. And so um, it's important to really have an open mind um, mm -hmm. about this. You know. People have said like going, uh, visiting the past is like visiting another country. So you really do have to be open to new experiences and really open to learning um, and not just assume that the way that we do things now is a better 
uh, or worse than say the clothing that they wore then. Um, but as I wore my stays, they actually molded to my body. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when I took them off, and I'm sure you've seen these with yours, mm -hmm. you, know, you actually have like the curve of the waist, the, the, yep. the, um, the tabs splaying out over the hips, because they eventually will become kind of almost like a second uh, like piece of armor in a way yeah. that you wear around your body. It's really sure. remarkable to think about what went into, especially now in this modern day world where everything's just like at our fingertips, especially here in a first world country. It's just like, you know what, what do, what can we not just have access to? I just go on my computer and I need a shirt and I order it and it's there. Right. So I, it, and I know that that's, that's a huge thing that you talk about and share about in the work that you do is sort of the slow fashion movement and, you know, remember what your hands can do, which is incredible. And I, and I, it really does stop the way that, um, well, it, it makes you stop and think about the way that things are done now versus then, which is, is really, if we're interested in this, that's probably what we should be trying to do with everything because that's how you get to understand what life was like. Yeah, I, de I definitely think, say, going through maybe the frustration even of making a pair of stays um, does at least give you the moment to kind of stop and consider just that the whole industry and the labor that went into it, not necessarily, you might be frustrated because you're like learning how to do it because that's right. just, that's the nature of learning, unfortunately. But right. um, I guess what I'm trying to say is when you make something, it really helps you reflect upon who made your clothing today, mm -hmm. who made your shoes today. Right. Um, there's always somebody behind the scenes. And that was the case in the 18th century. I mean, right. in, in the 18th century, you still had a lot of things available to you but you often would have a little bit more interaction maybe with the person who made them. Right. You know, so you might actually look that person in the eye and, and know who it was. Whereas today, like, like, like you may not know who made the shirt you're wearing. Um, right. You might know the label, but you may not know the actual individual or the people, all the people that are in the supply chain from textile to, to end result. And you wouldn't know that in the 18th century either. Cause of course, were existing in a capitalist global economy in the 18th century, mm -hmm. you know, fabric coming from China and India and, you know, right. Eastern Europe and all uh, in Northern Africa. Um, so there's kind of, it's interesting though, how, yes, you would really know more people who made your clothing, but yet at the same time, um, there, you're still removed from part of that supply chain. But I do think that the making um, definitely makes me more thoughtful about who made my clothing today. Um, also, I'm glad you brought up that idea of like, remember what your hands can do. Um, because that's kind of the tagline for some company because, you know, if you really take the time and practice and again, kind of have an open mind uh, and work with the hand sewing specifically on your clothing, you, there, there will be frustration because again, there's always frustration when, when it comes to it. But when you really persevere and you do the practice, um, it's amazing like what the reward is and it really reminds you what your hands can do. It reminds you what you're capable of. Um, so I think it's important for people to just kind of really kind of um, take the time, practice if you can, um, and, and maybe try and make like a petticoat completely by hand, make a pair of pockets by hand, mm -hmm. um, because I bet you can do it. The first one, the first or two might look kind of icky because that's the reality of it. But right. eventually once you get your flow, you can make some beautiful things with your hands. I think, you know, I've shared with you um, on, you know, on Instagram that, that you really inspired me recently with that um, because I, and I've shared this recently here on different episodes that coming into this and not coming in with a strong sewing background, like, you know, a lot of people, my mom, so my mom made a ton of my clothes growing up and, she, but it sure. wasn't other mo people are like, yeah, their moms are like, don't touch my sewing machine, you know, that, that like mentality. <laughs> yeah. And then I was old enough that I just didn't really care, wasn't interested in it. Um, and so yeah. when I, when I got into this, I really had these intentions of learning how to sew, of making these big, amazing pieces. And then I got into it and it was really, really hard and it was very confusing yeah. and overwhelming. And my brain just didn't seem to like grasp how you do this. And so even while I made, I made two, three, I made three really beautiful petticoats. Um, I've made one apron, but then I just was like, I realized I didn't enjoy doing it. Like I made it and I let, I was happy about it, but I didn't, yeah. I, I, so I felt different than other people who are making things on the Instagram, you know, how it goes. Cause I was like, yeah. I really don't enjoy this. This really isn't my, my um, contribution to the living history community where I realized now, you know, that was just kind of like giving up, like that I expected that I would feel, I wanted to feel the way 
that I thought other people feel based on what they were posting on Instagram, which is like, yeah. you know, the biggest yeah. like right. rule that you don't do, but it's like <laughs> people seem like they really enjoy this um, mm -hmm. and post things and then thinking, well, I didn't enjoy it. I don't want to do that again. It's very time consuming. Um, recently though, meeting you and virtually and seeing what you do and you talking about, remember what your hands can do. I was like, you know, the reason I got into this hobby for me, it's, you know, partly hobby and, and now business. But the reason I started to reenact and do living history was because I wanted to connect to the great grandmothers. Like that was so, I grew up on a rural, you know, cattle farm in central Florida. I watched like the grit of my grandmother, her entire, like my whole life. And I was so fascinated by her abilities. Um, and I wanted to know all these women before us, what they had done. I knew that I came from some real gritty women and I wanted to understand what their challenging lives would be like sewing and doing all of these things that they did. So I don't know, it just really, um, you did really inspired me to get back to the basics. Why did I start doing this? It's not about, it wasn't ever about like, I need to like it. I just need to understand it and know it. That was the, the point. So I've been, I'm almost finished with my second um, completely hand-sewn apron. So that has been exciting and it feels good. So thank you for that. Awesome. Well, yeah, you're, you're welcome. I was, I was really excited to hear that, honestly, um, because yeah, like I, I'll say this again, it's like hand sewing is, is difficult. And honestly, pretty much every project that I do is hard for me too. So there is like a level of frustration that goes into it. But at the same time, there's a level of flow and the end result can be so incredible. And sometimes it's not, but um, I'm really excited that you decided to try it again and maybe think about it a little bit differently. I think yeah. it's wonderful. It definitely changed. It changed my, my attitude about it. I've decided that I'm just going to stop saying that I'm bad at sewing and I don't sew. And I, I just was like, that's not, I need an attitude adjustment. So before we wrap up here, if you can share with people, um, especially since there, I know that you offer beginner um, sewing workshops and courses, but if you want to share all the offerings that even, you know, that you kind of regularly have or you have right now, that would be great. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, awesome. So, so currently I'm offering a series of live classes on Zoom that are three hours long and we go through kind of the basics of, of skill building. Um, recently I've off offered one about historical seaming techniques because not all hand sewing is, you know, created equal and there's so many different ways to sew seams. All right, so I also have um, an online course uh, devoted to actually skill building for hand rolled hems because hand rolled hems are the foundation for making nice ruffles and neck stocks and caps. And so if you're looking to really up your hand sewing game, that class is really geared to that kind of intermediate hand sewer um, who is ready to really practice your rolled hem so that you can make all the accessories that you want to make. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on and chatting. I have enjoyed getting to know uh, all of these exciting things that you have done and all of the really great things that you're offering to the community right now. And I hope that everybody will check out Sarah's information, sign up for some of her workshops and classes. You are a treat to learn from. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. I look forward to sewing with you soon. Yeah. <laughs>